Um, my name is Christina Friesen, and today I'm going to briefly cover the identif identification and control of both flies. Okay, so to get started, let's just define the term filth fly. The filth flies are flies associated with garbage, carrion, or manure. And there's actually quite a few kinds of flies that fall into this description. But today I'm going to discuss just four of them. And these are the ones that develop in manure or manure impacted environments. And that's going to be the house fly, the face fly, the stable fly, and the horn fly. And as we proceed through the talk, I'm going to cover identification, biology, and control methods for each. Um, the reason why I chose this topic is because after talking with quite a few producers, it seems like the prevalent thinking right now is that for the most part, there are exceptions, but for the most part, um, that a fly is a fly and what can I do to control it? And the problem is that for a fly control, there is no one size fits all solution. Um, each of these flies that we're going to cover has a different biology and life history, and that means that the control methods need to be tailored to each of the species. Um, so to have an effective fly control program, you really need to know what kind of fly you're dealing with, and you need to know something about its development and behavior. Okay, so starting with the house fly. So house flies are the most well-known of the four that we're going to cover, and they're obviously a non-biting pest. They're found almost everywhere. Uh, the main problem we have with house flies is their involvement in disease transmission. Um, but they can also be referred to as a nuisance fly as well. We'll get back to the diseases in just a second. Um, so what it means to be referred to as a nuisance fly simply means that in some situations, house flies can develop into high enough populations as to be a real nuisance to both animals and humans. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see all the black dots around the cans of feed and water. And this is probably a calf hutch of some sort at a dairy. This is actually a pretty common scene. And you can also find high numbers of houseflies in poultry houses, as Jeff just talked about, um, as in the bottom left-hand picture here. Um, the important thing to note about this and the reason why we need to take this seriously is because there have been a number of lawsuits and formal complaints um, that have been filed against livestock production facilities by surrounding neighbors when this problem spills over into their property. But outside of that, the main issue we really have with stable flies is their involvement in the spread of pathogens. Um, house flies have been implicated in the transmission of over 100 pathogens, including E. coli and salmonella. And in 2006, there was a major recall of bag spinach due to E. coli contamination. People might remember that. Uh, but the obvious question was, how did the spinach get contaminated with E. coli? And investigators actually gathered enough evidence to suggest that house flies were carrying it from an adjacent feedlot to the spinach field. Okay, so that's why we care about controlling house flies. Now something about their life history. And all of the flies that we're going to cover today have this basic developmental cycle that involves... Oh, okay, let me try this. Okay, so it involves the eggs, the larva, and the pupa, and then the adults. Okay, so the total developmental time can range from one to three weeks, depending on a number of factors. But the important thing to note here is that the immature stages, so the immature stages include the eggs, the larvae, and the pupae, are going to be in one kind of environment while the adults are going to be in another. And what that means is that an effective fly control program should include at least one measure targeting the immature stage and one measure targeting the adult stage. For house flies, the immatures are typically found in moist, decaying vegetation. And this can include crop residue or silage, but it often includes environments that are impacted by manure, most notably animal bedding. So calf hutches and calf pens are great places to find house fly larvae. So the substrate may look dry and crusty on top, but if you put on a pair of gloves and you lift up the top five centimeters or so, you'll see something that looks like this. Um, nice and moist and often with plenty of fly maggots and pupae. So in this picture here, here are the fly, fly maggots or the white worm-like things, and then the fly pupae are the red um, egg-shaped things that you would see in there as well. Uh, you can also find house flies developing in accumulated biosolids, um, as, um, for example, like in waste lagoons. 
such as in the picture that's shown right here. Right here. Okay, so for control of the adult houseflies, uh, the most common method involves insecticides as premise sprays or mists, but there's also a number of traps and baits on the market. Uh, for the immatures, biological control includes the use of parasitic wasps or terimolids and nematodes, and as we just heard from Jeff, uh, black soldier flies in poultry houses. Um, there are also a number of growth regulators in granular form that can be distributed over the larval developmental site, and this basically prevents the larvae from maturing into adults. But the most effective management option, and the one we highly recommend, is to identify the larval sources and to clean it up. And this can take on a few manifestations. Uh, first, you can compost the substrate. Uh, which essentially by heating it, uh, you're cooking any larvae that might be in there, as well as getting rid of the nutrients that they might need later on for development. Uh, you can also pile it up, as in this picture here. And while this doesn't completely eliminate larval production, it does greatly reduce it. So houseflies aren't going to typically develop in the bulk of this pile here, but you will find them along the skirts of the pile, like around this area right here. Or you can spread the substrate into a thin layer in a field. And obviously this adds nutrients to the field. Uh, but if this is done, just make sure that the substrate is spread thin. Um, if it's thick enough to maintain any moisture, the houseflies will develop in it. Now we're going to talk about the stable fly. You heard a little bit about this earlier. So stable flies look a lot like houseflies, except they have what's called an elbowed proboscis. Um, and that's this part right here. So this is the head of the adult housefly, and this is the, the mouth parts. And you can see it kind of juts out just like an elbow. Um, and then looking at the fly from above, that's what this looks like right here. This looks like a stick sticking right out. So both the males and the females are, are blood feeders. They prefer to feed on cattle, but given the opportunity, they'll feed on pretty much anything. And they typically feed on the lower extremities, as you heard earlier, so think the legs. And when stable flies bite, they hurt. It feels a lot like a, a horse fly or a deer fly uh, that bit you. And that's because if you look at the tip of their mouth parts, like for instance right here, um, they have these hard teeth that they use to braid the skin so that the blood pools and they can suck it up. And they can be aggressive too. For a while I researched uh, stable flies in a colony of American white pelicans. And this black mass that you see right here covering the eyes and the back of the head, those are all stable flies. Um, and in this picture you can see that they've attacked this pelican to the point where it's openly weeping blood here. Okay, now imagine that on the legs of cattle, and you can understand why cattle, are, when they're attacked by stable flies, they're going to do anything they can to protect their legs. And this often manifests itself in group bunching, as we talked about earlier, um, as seen here. And, you know, as was also mentioned in this scenario, in the middle of summer, now you're going to have to worry about heat stress as well. And then if there's a body of water or mud nearby, the cattle will wade in it uh, so that the water covers their legs. And essentially what this means is that the cattle are defending themselves instead of grazing, which leads to reduced weight gains for the producer. Okay, so in 2012, a colleague of mine here in Lincoln led a study that found that stable flies actually cost the U.S. cattle industry an estimated $2 billion a year. So it's quite a bit of money. And that's why we care about stable flies. The sources of larval development are very similar to house flies, with one exception uh, that was talked about earlier, and that's uh, primarily the hay residue that accumulates around these hay bales. Um, these are perfect stable, stable fly larval sources. Um, over time, as cattle pull the hay out to eat, Obviously, the residue accumulates along with manure, urine, and rain, and it just creates a great habitat for larval development. And incidentally, we typically don't find house flies here. Uh, we don't really know why, but uh, yeah, this is primarily a stable fly habitat. Okay, so for control, some of the control methods are similar to those for house flies as well. Um, later, we'll talk more about the walkthrough boxes. Um, but there are also some traps and insecticide-treated nets that are available for 
for adult control. But like the house flies, we typically tell people to find the sources of larval development, either treat it with a biological or chemical form um, of control, or clean it up. Okay, moving on to the face fly. So the first two flies that we talked about, the, the house fly and the stable fly, are flies uh, that develop in manure impacted environments. Uh, the next two, the face fly and the horn fly, develop in intact manure pads, and as such are primarily pests of pastured cattle. So the first one that we're going to talk about, the face fly, is an, also a non-biting fly. It's predominantly a pest of cattle, but can also affect horses. Um, face flies are essentially identical to house flies, with the exception that the males have this bright orange abdomen, which you can see over here. And they also have strong teeth at the end of their mouth parts. So this is another up close picture at the end of their mouth parts. And you can see these, these ridges that form here and they're actually really strong. And they use it to scrape the conjunctival tissues around the eyes and the nose of the animal. And so this produces more tears or lacrimal secretions. And these are rich in proteins, which is great for egg development. The problem with this is that they're scraping open sensitive tissue, and any time you see this, um, it's opening up the animal to secondary infections. The most notable of these infections is pink eye, uh, which is a bacterial infection, uh, but base flies have also been known as a host for delasia or eye worms. And you can see this is the conjunctiva here, and you can see the little, the little worms um, in this area here. So obviously they're also a problem. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the source of larval development for face flies is straightforward. It's an intact manure pot, which means it's associated with pastured cattle. But this also means that larval control is very difficult. Uh, you can imagine instead of having a few concentrated sources of larval development, as with the house flies and stable flies, now you've got a large area covered with lots of larval sources. Adult face fly control can be achieved through the use of ear tags or self-medicating uh, devices such as back rubbers or oilers. Um, essentially, you pick the insecticide of your choice and load up the rubber with it. Um, people used to use diesel. I wouldn't recommend it. I don't think that many people do that anymore. Um, but basically, the animal realizes that by walking underneath it, it dislodges the face flies. And the bonus is that um, it is also just um, treated the animal with future fly face fly attacks. For the immatures, um, you can use feed throughs, which typically come mixed in a mineral. Uh, so the animal ingests the IGR, and it comes out the other end in the manure. And so again, this basically prevents the larvae from developing into adults. And there's also been some work looking into dung beetles. So to answer Carl's question earlier, um, this is one way that dung beetles can be applied directly to help with uh, fly control. But they're breaking up the manure pads. Um, then um, obviously they're disrupting the larval habitat of face flies. Okay, and then finally we have the horn fly. So horn flies are similar to stable flies except they're typically smaller and their mouth parts are, are flanked by palpi. So with the stable fly we just have this one uh, part coming out here with the horn flies. You can kind of see these fleshy parts on either side of it that are flanking it. Those are called the palpi. And horn flies are primarily associated with cattle, but they can also be found on bison. So if you've ever been through Yellowstone National Park, um, you know, sometimes there's a lot of bison walking through the area and you just kind of have to stop and let them go. Um, and, you know, sometimes the bison will walk right by your vehicle. And you can see the horn flies on them. Um, Whereas stable flies spend maybe five to 10 minutes per day feeding on the legs of cattle, horn flies spend essentially their whole adult lives on either the back or the belly of a cattle, and they feed 20 to 35 times per day. Horn fly populations can really build up. Um, it's not uncommon during the height of horn fly season to see one of 4,000 horn flies per animal, and on bulls it's even higher. Uh, we think they're attracted to the testosterone, so there's always more on bulls. Um, and I've actually seen a bull with over 10,000 horn flies on it. And when you consider that each fly is feeding 25 to 30 times a day, that represents a significant amount of blood loss. 
The greatest impact horn flies of horn flies appears to be on milk production and consequently weight gain in yearly calves. Uh, horn flies are known to transmit a uh, staphylococcus, um, which is a bacterium, um, and it can cause teat mastitis. And so here's a picture um, of what a healthy teat looks like. And then here's a picture that's partially black because of the dying tissue. Um, it's probably been infected with staph. And this is actually a pretty benign picture. If mastitis goes untreated, the teat can be completely destroyed. And it's been estimated that horn flies can cause about $880 million per year. So the sources of larval development, again, it's intact manure pets. And for control, we take advantage of the fact that the adults spend so much of their time on the animal. So ear tags have been effective for eliminating adults. Um, ear tags are treated with different insecticides. The ones applied to the animal will disseminate um, the insecticide throughout the coat of the animal. Incidentally, the least amount of this ingredient makes its way to the legs, which is one of the reasons why this is un ineffective for stable fly control. Um, oilers, back rubbers, and dusters are also used. And recently, there's been a modified walkthrough box that's been brought to market. Um, it's produced by Spalding, and it may be a good fit for any facility that interacts with its animals once or twice a day, uh, such as dairies. And essentially, the animal walks through the box, and it just vacuums the flies off the animal. Um, this has been used quite a bit in North Carolina, where it was invented and someone in Florida and Minnesota. And from what I've seen, the data shows that this is a very promising tool for the situations where TUS is appropriated. Now, the only drawback is that it costs around $7,500, which can be a bit much. Uh, to control the immatures, features well, um, are another recommendation. Uh, and again, the use of dung beetles is increasingly being looked at as a viable option, as well as grazing method. We just heard from Jeff that those two are apparently related to each other. Um, and there are also a number of alternative methods that haven't been scientifically evaluated, but sometimes you'll find in practice. So one of these methods involves chickens. Um, so about three days after you've moved the cattle from one piece of pasture, uh, the idea is that you put the chickens in and they'll scratch at the manure to get at the horn fly larvae, which they love. And it's kind of a two-fold solution because theoretically they reduce the horn fly population and they work the manure into the soil. Um, so in theory, it sounds like a good idea, but I'm not really sure if it's ever been formally tested or evaluated. And so that's it. It's kind of a quick look, um, quick, and, quick and fast look at house flies, stable flies, base flies, and horn flies.